Yeah. The only way to do, the only way to try to change the world is is to look about it as an actual service. Otherwise, you just burn out after for six months. Yeah, that's Everything's the world's a bit of a tricky place, isn't it? Do you want me to put one on or you? I've only got um, the one, but um, to your chest. you're not So, wh what's this going to go on? Um, well, we have a... Are you filming this for XR as well, then? No, he's just asked me to film it for him. Oh, <laughs> I, I didn't have any battery, but then my friend <laughs> yeah, came yeah, back with fine. the battery. Yeah, yeah, fine. So, what are you putting it on? Uh, I don't know. To be honest, I just thought it might be an interesting conversation. Get it yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I'm going to get the hands for it or anything. Might stick it on YouTube, but that's all right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we can talk about I'm it. Just, uh, usually I'm fine about it all. I'm just a bit stressed at the moment because like, I'm about, as I was just saying, I'm a bit, I'm, you know, this Heathrow thing is just going to be massive and you know, people don't really realise how big it's going to be and I'm probably going to end up getting locked up. It's going to bring a lot of attention to you, It's going to be like Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to be, probably going to be number one. So I'm trying to like, as I was just saying, I just want to go on holiday with my kids and then I'll be ready. Well, it sounds like you're hits, making yeah. a lot of influential kind of supporters and stuff like that, people that are desperate to see solutions in the world, so maybe they'll be able to help you out with that kind of thing. Um, but me and you yeah. have... <laughs> Get me, me out, yeah. Potentially. <laughs> me, me and you have a, a mutual interest in the, the history of protest, the history of, uh, you know, civil resistance. I'm a, I'm a green anarchist. I've been raised an environmentalist. Uh, my grandfather has been environmental campaigning for 50 years. I've been oh, you're one of those. My life. Yeah. Uh, they're one of those activist aristocracy types. Like. Uh, I don't know about aristocracy. I keep meeting all I these. Come... I keep meeting all these people in the Labour Party. Are sort of cool, and they're, they're all related to Lord So and So or whatever. And um, you know, it's like, all oh, right, this yeah. goes goes back about four generations. Well, it's been it? a closed really shop for a long time, hasn't it? But, yeah, yeah, it's sort of interesting. But in, in the Forest anyway. of we had this concept of the poor man's aristocracy, so it's a mining community, and, yeah. and the uh, the miners were given rights to build homes. Everybody else was technically a legal squatter on the crown land, right? So uh, the aristocracy were from a different different point. Anyway. We have a, a mutual interest in the history of protest. I'm very much interested in the development of the ideas around climate change and carbon and things like this. And I, I've spent quite a lot of time looking into the history of it. And uh, as, you're, as you're aware, back in the 1930s, we were in a very, in the world economy, was in a very similar situation to what it is now. Massive unemployment, depression and things like that. And there were a lot of really interesting discussions being had around economics, around political reform and things like that. It just in pubs, people were discussing the banking system for the first time. It was a really exciting time. There was a lot of potential for change. And out of this sort of milieu, out of this kind of uh, situation that we found ourselves in back then, uh, a group in Columbia University set up an organisation called Technocracy, a bunch of uh, academics, students and things like that. Now they had the idea of, they were against the capitalists and the communists, which puts them in a very interesting position. Mostly academics, but they did have a lot of backers in other industries as well. And they came up with the idea of replacing price-based economics with energy certification. So your clothes, everything would be priced in terms of the energy that was expended in order to manufacture it. And they were sort of pushing this in the universities and stuff. They got quite influential. I think they were kicked out of Canada. Uh, Elon Musk's father was involved in it. He fled Canada from persecution by the government, went to South, South Africa, I believe, for a while. And this, this system kind of, this idea kind of died out and waned a little bit as the economy started to run a little bit smoother in America and the inflation and stuff. Um, but the idea in around the 1970s was revived by a man called Zbigniew, Zbigniew Brzezinski. I'm probably completely murdering the name. Uh, he's Ukrainian. A uh, very, very influential geopolitical character still today, maybe one of the most, in fact. Uh, I've been interested in this man for a long time. And it seems to me that you know, the United Nations took a lot of the ideas that the technocrats had back in the 1930s of having your economy based on energy certifications rather than money. And the United Nations revived those ideas and created, instead of energy certifications, they created the carbon credits. And it seems to me that if everything is going to have a price in carbon, which some of the, the biggest bankers and sort of industrialists around the world are saying we need a price to carbon, right? Um, that there's going to be this synthesis between money as we think of it today and carbon emissions uh, basically the when as soon as those two things are linked then we're in a completely different economic situation we're in one that's a global a global kind of system uh, of accountancy and there's a lot of potential pitfalls with that it's, it's basically it's going to it's going to circumvent the entire economy as we see it now simultaneously the united nations is positioning itself be the world's environment and uh, climate regulator. Uh, and I see that as, a, as an activist, as a green activist and an anarchist. 
I see that as a huge land grab because if you control the economic and environmental development of land, you're essentially in control of that land. Uh, so I, I'm worried that forces within the United Nations will piggyback on the, the really good movement to protect the environment, which is obviously uh, overlaps with the climate movement, and will steer it towards a, a one system, economic, political system, and the largest land grab in human history, as in the United Nations will preside and control the development of all nations. Okay, so let me tell you my viewpoint. I'd be fascinated. I've been looking forward to this for a while, actually. My viewpoint is, is that all, all rebellion is started by people that largely have no idea about what's going to come next. Most, most, your archetypical rebel basically isn't outcome orientated. It's basically like an emotional motivation, which goes something like this. Things have become so shit, I don't give a fuck anymore when I die. I'm just going to do what I can to do something. Oh, that one, yeah. That's what the guys did when, you know, a group of us guys from the Welsh Valleys that went to the Spanish Civil War and there's research on the motivation. Like, that's what people do, you know. The guy who does research for Oxford, goes around the global south. You know, the, the people that step up to do what needs to be done are usually uneducated about their as religious, which can be happiness, you know, they've got profound value system about what's right now. of influence will be more able to, you know the, the famous uh, quote by the arch imperialist Cecil Rhodes, we, we can't damn a world current, but we can direct it towards the right channel. And I'm yeah, aware of these people are in incredibly powerful positions of influence, Look, that, that we're going to be able to redirect mean, the climate that, yeah, that, I mean, towards that their own end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that doesn't mean for a moment, myself or the people that originated Extinction Spelling have read our history, right? They're more than familiar with the idea that once you've had some mass disruption, then, you know, part of the reactionary elite will want to un undermine it by any means possible. So we know, sort of, we know that, that and we also know that a lot of the elites, you know, do have a nervous breakdown and they accept, you know, the new reality as well. So it's not like, you know, you need to be nuanced about these things, but, you know, you have to have eternal vigilance in society. Indeed, so, the old world order is collapsing, the old uh, yeah. nationalistic, finance-based sort of world order is collapsing. I'm just worried that they're, they're 10 steps ahead of us and that the replacement that they're bringing in is this technological replacement in which yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, car know. carbon credits, I mean, I carbon certifications are... Yeah, I was talking to some guys from a big conventional think tank yesterday, right? And they, they, you know, they talk to the guys that are running the world economy all the time. And, and you know, obviously, there's another agenda out there, which is, you know, the, the nationalist right and, you know, Proposition, which is we hunt down into authoritarian nation states. We kill people that disagree with us, and we kill people that want to come into our country. You know, and that's that's the 20th century defect. Yeah, right? and we're, we're moving so, from from that know, system. What I'm trying, system. What I'm trying to do is, you know, into this lovely green gallery here, and these people, are, you know, it's like 1913. These people are sleepwalking into hell. Very, very and much they don't actually your, yeah. understand. Yeah. Because they haven't got anything in their life experience, you know. I mean, some of them have, of course, because some have had shitty lives, and some have worked in the global south. I've worked in the global south when I went there, you know. Local work has just been shot, and the police have gone and raped all these women in these villages. You know, it's like, it's a different moral universe, right? That, that's where, that's what, that's what's coming down the tracks. You're, you're an academic, man. I know you've studied this uh, very closely, and yeah. you've looked into the history of the climate change thing. It, it seems to me that right from the early onset of this, from the, the first environmental Stockholm conference in the environment, uh, to the creation of the IPCC, which was uh, 
top of that was Maurice Strong, right, the, uh, the oil billionaire from America. And he was the one that kind of set up the IPCC and set the questions that it was going to be yeah, investigated. Yeah. Okay. So they've been, they've been positioning themselves I know, I know. to be I don't able want, to set themselves up as I don't want to talk about why the like bad guys. I really don't want to talk about why the bad guys are bad and why they are probably bad. Oh, we all right? we all know why they're bad. We, we, you know, it's just it's like it's not, useful, it's not a useful discussion. I, I'd you know, like to see what, Extinction what? Rebellion develop like an immune system for this kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's the thing to focus but on. But what we need to focus on is what we can do, not why the bad guys are bad and why they're probably no, it's, win. It's so, you fashion. know, that's what we focus on but in we, Extinction Rebellion. We need to understand the history of these things if we're going to plot sure, a, and a you good trajectory into the future. Yeah, a general rule of thumb is you know cause maximum destruction in a non-violent respectful way and create a culture of resistance so that you are ready to for a two three year struggle right you know which is probably how long it usually takes to transform a society i mean obviously officially you can transform it in eight days or ten days like i said in my talk but you know i haven't got time in the talk to go through the nitty gritty of it but you know the general the general idea is then the elites come back and they try and rob you and then you have to come back back on the streets and you need all the rest I of it. I don't see them as resisting the movement for um, carbon taxation, carbon credits, things like that. I see them as leading it. I think they've led it from, from the very early onset. And, uh, there, yeah, I mean, a lot I don't know. You're talking, it's, a bit, it's above you've, my pay grade. You've heard of Marie Strong. <laughs> you've heard of Marie Strong, surely. So you know, Marie Strong set up the IPCC. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. but I don't have any, it doesn't, you know, and you're talking to the wrong guy. I don't, no, no, I don't. I know you've studied the history of this. You're probably one of the most knowledgeable people. Yeah, what I, I know, have a chance to what I know there. about is mobilisation, revolution, change. That's yeah. my specialty. Uh, and and you know, but uh, and my the, the the result of my research on it is is you know it doesn't matter what the bad guys. As I said, it doesn't really matter what the bad guys are do or don't do. The main no, thing it is the focus. What we do. Yeah, it matters what we do. But and the, ma the major causal factor of success is how organised and savvy the ah. activists are that actually organise yeah, it. Uh, and that's highly shown, informed, which, as you've said, a lot of people are so informed about the history yeah. of it. And yeah. the, yeah. Without yeah. knowing the history of how we got to this stage, yeah. it's hard to plot it. Uh, well, I don't, you know, I don't have a, I don't, I, uh, seriously, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful or anything, I just seriously don't have an opinion. I mean, not because I'm thick or anything, it's just, I just don't know. I just don't know what the bad guys, who the bad, you know, I don't know the nitty gritty of it and I don't know <coughs> what they may or may not do, it's too complicated. But it's, it's what I'm looking at is, I'm looking at October and, you know, what's what's coming next. The, the and, question and we really have to ask about the extinction rebellion is, is, is it a rebellion when there's so many people within the political establishment, within the financial oligarchy globally, that are completely in support of the financialization of carbon, the financialization of nature, things like natural assets and things like that. Right, where does, they're going to offset the environmental damage by places like Forest of Eden, my beautiful home. Well, they, let's concretize they're gonna, it, right? They're going to look at the, yeah, they're on. Gonna look at the Forest of Eden, like a large carbon sink. Mm. They're going to monetize that asset and then they're going to be able to play these uh, financial gains on the, the global markets with it and offset their environmental damage abroad. There's a hell of a lot of money to be made in that. Yeah, yeah, okay. So bad people might do all sorts of bad things. They may, right? But it doesn't come back to the fundamental analysis, which is you have to create mass mobilisation, and then the other side of the extinction rebellion game plan is to create city to city assembly. And at that city to assembly, you'll be going along as a witness saying, This is a shit speed. And then the city and assembly will say, No, we're not doing that. You know, the rich will have to pay their fair, fair share and all the rest of that. And then the rich or powerful will go, no, we're not. And then it will be happening all over again. Very interested in the citizens. I was talking to your, yeah. your friend earlier. What was her name? Uh, don't know. Uh, <laughs> she, she was uh, she very much in, into that and very knowledgeable about it. I had a good discussion about it. And uh, I'm a little bit concerned about that as well. Because if you have 250 or a few thousand randomly selected people, it doesn't allow for local distinctions. It doesn't allow for you know, two-thirds of those people are going to be urban, two-thirds of those people are going to be from London, where the two neighbours are going to be. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's nuance around it. Like, you know, the obvious, the obvious stretch is not to have just one national um, assembly. The idea would be to obviously have subsidiarity, you know, they make the decision at the lowest level possible I've, level. I've looked into the one that happened in, in Ireland as well. Yeah. It was quite interesting. It yeah, seems yeah, like yeah. the, the mean, real question is who frames the terms, it's yeah, the same yeah, with the IPCC, I mean, who, who yeah, frames yeah, the I question know, I know. and how, how, much power, how much power <laughs> is being given yeah. to the, yeah, to the know, basically yeah. linguistic experts who are going to be there framing the, the discussion beforehand and then you have the appeal to uh, the authority. But actually, actually, Most no. people will go yeah, along with the accredited experts. Yeah, it seems yeah. like the conclusions are like, 
describe it. It's gonna it's gonna end up somewhere where the the linguistic and academic elite who are setting the questions want it to end up. Yeah, well, just you have to check out the appearance because that's not usually what happens. What usually happens is that people ready to change their opinions. I mean, but you know, it's not utopian. Obviously, there's no such thing as the right decision because every decision is is flawed because it's in the real world. I, what we're looking at is a, a good enough or even very good solutions that come through the best thing humans have got, which is, you know, the best thing we've got is our ability to sit down and through open, respectful deliberation work out what we want to do. All, all in, fa yeah, all in favour of open the deliberation the, debate. of the anarchist proposition. It's a lost art, unfortunately. Yeah, it is, but it's there, right? I mean, you know, I, I'm a secessionist. I, I think the best way forward, just from my own personal view, yeah. is to break the regions down, Wales is independent, even areas like the Forest of where we're setting up an independence campaign, and then you trial out different systems for dealing with environmental degradation, yeah. but different political and economic systems, kind of like the Greek states. So it's like an open source development of political and economic systems. Some will not do so well, yeah, some yeah, will do yeah. really great, but we'll learn a hell of a lot in the process. That's what I'm sort of there all about and pushing for. Yeah. And sortition and the National Assembly does recognise the, the importance of regionalisation. But it's still on those old imperialist sort of scale, the whole of the UK and then the whole Yeah, planet. it's an argument. It's, a, it's an argument. There's pluses and minuses on both sides. And I'm familiar with the literature, you know, I've read the anarchist literature, I think it's great. <laughs> and, um, so you, are you in favour of, like, are you in favour of regionalisation? I'm in favour like, of not, I'm in like favour of the fundamental anarchist proposition, which is don't predict the future. Predicting the future is a fundamentally, <laughs> a fundamentally, like, reactionary notion. Right? Isn't that what the climate scientists are themselves trying to Yeah, 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 but you know what I'm trying model. to say, you've read the literature, like, like, you know, revolutionaries of some of the most dangerous people in history, right? Because yeah. they come up with a plan, they win power and then they kill people because they've got a plan, right? So, you know, the alternative is what Extinction Rebellion is going to do, which is, you know, read the liberal critique of revolution, which is you have to have separation of powers, you have to do it step by step and the result isn't going to be perfect. Your, your right? comrade, so, Gail Bradbrook, uh, said on the Sky News quite recently, that, uh, see if I can remember the exact uh, quote. We're in contact with people, but she said that we're in contact with the, you're in contact with ministerial level government officials and things like that, and that they are saying to her, presumably saying to yourself as well, that they are looking for social permission to quote, do the necessary. And that Extinction Rebellion is about giving them the social permission for something they already have concluded that is necessary to do, which is link carbon dioxide to some sort of accountancy system. It's going to be global and administered by the United Nations. Yeah, yeah, we have to go and engage in the debate, yeah. I'm, I'm trying, yeah, that, that's what... <laughs> but I want to go and have my nap now. Would you, <laughs> one, right. one last question, of course. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but one last question. Yeah. I would love to get you, Gail, and some of the other people organised in Extinction Rebellion on a panel of open debate, perhaps like we'll sit down for a good hour or so with all recorded and everything, and really develop that uh, that culture of open, honest debate. Yeah, I mean, I think, that I, think the best, I think the best people to do it are people that have got skills in like, you know, We've economic and political yeah. uh, uh, design. We're all environmentalists, I think that's the commonality that we share yeah. here. Yeah, so yeah, I think it's a... Yeah, all I think it's a vital debate. But a broad church, debate. You know, lots of yeah. different people, lots yeah, of yeah. different perspectives. Yeah, yeah, I know. Would, really would, you, would you commit to that? Would Probably you, uh... not, because I'm too busy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, not this open, year, anyway. You're too busy to have an open debate? Maybe, maybe not yourself. No, I mean, maybe seriously, I get this. about three requests a day yeah. to do stuff, right? I'm yeah, just totally bet, overwhelmed. Bet, it's yeah. just, like, ridiculous. And I feel really bad about it, because I started off thinking, oh, you know, those poor guys, I've been in that position, you know, trying to get an interview for my research, so I was trying to be really good. And now, basically, I've got this guy that does my diary for me, and I have to focus. So it's him I have to speak to, is it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's bad, right? But it's because I, you know, I've got all these... Delegating responsibility, you've got a lot yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, it is wherever it is. But, you know, basically my focus is on closing the Heathrow Airport in September and causing a fuss. But yeah, if we'll the food shortages that we all know are coming over here, yeah. then perhaps our own food is the thing that we need to be focused well, on. Yeah, well, yeah, who knows? That's my plan. I've got to go now. It's been a pleasure. I, I hope to... Yeah, yeah, I'm really well, sorry I can't have no, a long not discussion. At all. I, I hope to have, have you on, on a speak, panel at some point. Yeah, yeah, by all means. Yeah, yeah, it's not for... Yeah, as I said, it's just... Feel feel free to get in touch and everything. Yeah. I just I just honestly can't say I'll definitely do it. You know what I mean? Uh, well, I'll keep but, pestering you about it. Yeah, yeah, by all means. Don't, don't stop pestering. That's fine. It's, uh, <laughs>